from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, good afternoon. I'm David Kirsch. Uh, if you have any hard questions, Jyoti's uh, sitting right back there. Um, and uh, our colleague Doug Ord uh, could not be here today, but uh, is very much a partner in the work uh, that I'll be talking to you about. Uh, and uh, let me just start by saying it's always wonderful to be back here at the Library of Congress. And thank you, uh, Aaron and Kate, uh, for uh, organizing, and um, Kevin as well. Um, so uh, this is uh, a project that's been going on for some years now. Um, we've been recently reinvigorated by the actual arrival of some data. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, uh, talking about archiving and accessing email from failed companies. Um, and uh, just a quick uh, high-level outline, uh, talk about uh, why we're here, some of the uh, policy development challenges, uh, a quick picture into uh, the two collections we're working on now, and uh, a little bit about next steps. Uh, so first, just by way of introduction, so I'm, I'm here, um, I'm a historian. I'm, you know, uh, for me, my involvement with this entire uh, challenge of digital records over the last, uh, I think, 15 years, uh, when I kind of wandered into the doors of this building and said, what format should I save things in? Um, and uh, you know, little did I know what uh, the can of worms I had opened. Um, but uh, the, the ch uh, this really comes from my interest in understanding um, and asking questions about firms. How do we understand the modern organization? How do we look inside the modern organization uh, to uh, do the kind of, of research that uh, historians have done on great organizations of the past. Um, and, um, you know, my contention for, for many years has been if we just get the email, we'll have most of what we need. That may not be true going forward, but I think up to, to today, I think that's uh, still reasonably true. Uh, and now the other thing to note is that most of, of history of firms has had this very strong survivor bias. It's been written about the great firms that have succeeded. We, we read about Ford, uh, not the 300 other failed automakers. We read about, um, uh, well, you know, Ford and GM, perhaps. Um, and uh, my own view, looking at the current situation, and I've written a little bit about this, is that rather than thinking about sort of history being written by the winners, that uh, going forward, the, the winners are the one, the surviving firms are the ones that have the power to uh, control their own records and actually destroy them because that's what firms do. Um, and in fact, what the records to which scholars and uh, researchers will have access are actually going to be the records of the failed firms. Um, and that's okay, because I think failed firms are interesting in their own right. They're understudied, and we can learn a lot from what goes on in failed firms. Uh, but we have to kind of see this as a, a, a kind of sea change in some sense in the kinds of records to, to which we're uh, likely to have access in the future. Um, just a quick list of of uh, the many uh, um, invaluable partners that have been part of this project over the last uh, uh, some years. Um, and in particular, I'll just draw your attention to this top uh, item here. And if you've been sitting in the back, you can't read it. So it says intermediaries. Um, and I'm very interested in this idea of organizations that pool the records of other organizations. Um, so uh, many of the uh, partnerships that uh, we've tried to establish have been with, with these sorts of organizations, with, say, a venture capital firm that receives lots of business plans and, and startups. Uh, well, then those records are 
kind of centralized in that venture capital firm, what can we do with them? Um, Sherwood Partners, one of the organizations that brought us the, one of the collections we're talking about today, um, is what's called a workout specialist. They help liquidate failed venture capital for investments. So there's a venture capital firm uh, invests in a startup, the startup does a bunch of stuff, it, it fails, Sherwood gets its records. And it gets about one failed startup a week, uh, just rolling up to the warehouse in a big pallet, boxes, hardware, um, IP, all kinds of just mixed in there. Um, and I think you know somebody this morning talked, mentioned this idea. Oh well, we need to talk to the the donors in advance. Failed firms are never. We can never get them in advance, <laughs> right? Because they by the time they fail, it's too late. Our best bet is a company like Sherwood, whose job is to go collect those materials. Um, and then obviously many other. Uh, critical partners, funders, scholars, and um, of course, not least, uh, repositories where uh, scholars can go to access these materials. Um, so just real quickly uh, into the collection development question. So I've sort of set this up as a, a bit of a, um, you know, open-ended process. Firms generate email. Will we ever see it as researchers? And my, my contention to you is that if firms, if the firm is thriving, you know, I'd like to see um, Eric Schmidt's email. Good luck, right? Um, if Google fails, then we have an opportunity to actually see the email. Um, and so I've, I've tried to kind of unpack this process a little bit, and I realize that per, having sat in the back, I know the slides will be a little hard to, to read, but the idea that first um, box is the most critical one. The firms fail, they lose control of their records, including their email. And then these third parties aggregate it, stabilize it for a period of time, and then the repositories come in, process the collection, and figure out how we might distribute it, allow access, et cetera. And, and it's then that the researchers have, have access to something. So it's, this I think is, is the process that I'd like to share with you today. Um, so real quickly, a couple sample collections. So the first one is called Avocado IT um, and made it pretty easy to search Google images for the associated uh, um, and this was a sample of um, uh, an email backup of a failed firm that I found uh, while rummaging around in the records at this Sherwood Partners. And you know what we did there was um, a lot of risk assessment, um, trying to balance sort of the technical and institutional mechanisms for mitigating risk. Uh, in the end, we did do some redaction, um, of the PII stuff, as somebody said, that's easy. I think that's actually true at this point. It's just search for the right strings and just make sure you replace them all um, you know, with some simulacrum and you know, we, we know how to do that. Um, we chose um, to um, redact all images uh, just because we couldn't read them. So the only things that were included in the final collection were things that we could render as text. And again, that may, you know, maybe that's overly um, conservative, but given that the people in, the, the individuals in this firm did not ever consent to have these records preserved. All they did was go to work and their firm failed. Um, we felt like we probably needed to be a little more careful in some of the other boundaries that we were drawing. Um, and we did, in the end, anonymize the name of the firm. So Avocado IT is the, um, is the anonymized name of the firm. And that was actually a very last minute decision. We weren't sure if we needed to do that. Uh, the, the donor, the Sherwood Partners that 
uh, pooled these records didn't require us to do that. We just thought, oh, why don't we put a little wrapper on it? Um, and then we did um, arrange some institutional um, limits as well. So the collection is being distributed through the linguistic um, data um, consortium at the University of Pennsylvania. And we have a special set of agreements that were rather laboriously negotiated that each user and organization has to sign to make sure that they're acknowledging the terms under which they're being granted access. Um, and you know, this is just the record in the LDC finding aid. Um, you know, so the, the email collection has been released. We released it on February 16th, so a couple months ago. Um, again, we've been processing it for a while, uh, but uh, there it is. Um, and there is a, uh, I guess, you know, we called it a readme <laughs> file, but it's really a finding aid. Um, and it describes um, what, what we did to the, to the collection to allow it to be uh, released. And uh, just in terms of the um, kind of high level uh, descriptive statistics, um, there are about 900,000 emails in the collection and we're expecting that people uh, are using it for um, language processing, um, e-discovery, um, whatever forms of uh, um, IS research that, that people want. Um, but you will see there, there was a fair um, amount, you know, about 400,000 items were redacted, um, and those tended to be attachments that we couldn't interpret. Uh, so um, we at least have a record of that. Uh, and then finally, just a minute or two on the, on the Brobeck collection, and this is an, an even more kind of, I, I might, uh, who was it, Dorothy this morning saying she had the, the collection challenge from hell. Um, this, this one might give you a run for your money um, because these are records of lawyers. Um, <laughs> and so we know absolutely that they're confidential and um, many of the communications are privileged. Um, and uh, Jyoti's been just working on this material recently that uh, we actually were granted legal access to in uh, August of 2006 um, by a bankruptcy judge in San Francisco, thanks to the help of many people in this room. Uh, but uh, the actual records didn't arrive at our loading dock until January 5th of 2015. So, it was nine years of twiddling my thumbs, uh, you know, where are the data? Um, but we do have them, and um, this is just a, a, a document type. Um, you'll see that uh, PST is actually just bundled with miscellaneous down at the very bottom. It's, it's you know, much less than 1% of the total files are PSTs. But of course, they're extremely important and interesting, and they, they themselves contain uh, many uh, hundreds of thousands of individual messages. So when you uh, uh, break out the PSTs, um, you know, this is, a, again, a very high-level description of what, uh, what we're looking at. Uh, and I see my time is up, which is good, because I believe that is the last slide. So just quickly, we're going to be doing some uh, uh, continuing work to try and increase access to the avocado collection that we've already released, um, talking to Sherwood Partners about uh, additional email collections and working with the Hagley Museum up in um, uh, uh, Wilmington, which is also a, a national digital preservation partner uh, for figuring out how to um, perhaps collect additional email collections, and, um, and thinking a little bit about uh, what to do with Brobeck, talking to some of the people in, in this building. So uh, thank you very much, it's, and I uh, look forward to uh, answering any questions you might have.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Anthony Cosiola from Pratt Institute School of Information and Library Science. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you today a little bit about a project that I just actually recently wrote up. It's in your background reading list, um, and it's going to be published in a few months by Records Management Journal. Um, and so um, Aaron had asked me to talk a little bit about policy. Um, I'll have a little bit of policy, but then some other things in here. So, um, But I'm going to tell you about this project that I worked on as a consultant and a little bit as a, as a researcher. Um, it's for an art museum in New York, which happens to be, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum. Um, just a little disclaimer, I don't represent the museum, but I did work there for about a year on this electronic records project. Um, and it finished up around uh, September of last year. Um, so they have a paper archives, and this they basically received a grant to do an electronic records project for the first time to ever, you know, to look at their electronic records. Um, and email, of course, was a part of it. So, you know, what did they have in terms of policy with regard to email? Pretty much in 2005, the Board of Trustees of the museum had approved a, a record schedule which had significant correspondence as a permanent record group. Um, and so that was pretty much it. it. You know, what is significant correspondence? I mean, it pretty much said, you know, important stuff. It said important activities, important events. It didn't really, you know, and that, that was it for policy. I mean, that was it. And then, you know, around 2013, they got this grant to do something with their electronic records. Um, so what ended up happening? I mean, pretty much, you know, like many of you, they had Novell GroupWise till 2002, and it looks like they migrated off to Microsoft Exchange. Um, but pretty much they had acquired a cache of PST files, and most of these had came from, you know, when staff go to leave, IT would hold on to it. Um, so sometimes, you know, the archivists weren't necessarily consulted when people left, um, but, you know, sometimes a, a supervisor would have to request a PST got retained. But for the most part, it was just kind of like there happened to be PST files. Um, so they had about 365 PST files. Um, and there's about 250 people who work at the museum. So definitely much, you know, much smaller scale than the Department of Interior. Um, <laughs> so we're like, OK, so what do we do to make this better? You know, we considered new infrastructures. You know, we thought about what the folks at Michigan were doing with the me Mail project, creating this kind of second, you know, this kind of archival mailbox. We're like, it's not going to work. We can hardly manage our own, you know, just the primary mailboxes. Like, good luck getting a second mailbox. Um, you know, we put in some infrastructure to transfer. You know, people could transfer email collections. But for the most part, we realized, you know what? Like, people are not going to do it. So let's keep doing what we've been doing, like aggressively try to get PST files when people leave. Um, that was what we thought was our best bet. So kind of as my, as my little research project I did off of this, I was kind of interested in like, okay, so how do we actually get significant email? So we have all these PST files, you know, how do you get from that to significant email that you could then archive? And the records retention schedule for the museum mostly said, you know, 25 years after creation. So, you know, there's a, you know, there, nothing's go available to the public anytime soon. Um, must we go through every single message? And I said, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through every single message for three important mailboxes, two curators and one executive, just so I can see like what this is like and like how we can make this better and make this work. Um, so I was like, OK, first I have to define what significant email is. So I created a rubric, scales one to four, four being very significant, one being very insignificant. And looking at, you know, looking at four factors, subject matter being a big one, like, you know, really connecting it with the mission. You know, a mission of like a museum, for example, like the Guggenheim would be around, um, you know, curating exhibitions, bringing objects into the permanent collection, uh, acting as an educational institution. So emails that had that kind of flavor were kind of that, that subject matter was important. A lot of things, obviously not important. Um, you know, HR benefits, who really cares, you know? Um, so looking at sent actor, received actor, um, you know, Pretty much, you know, executives, curators, conservators, those are kind of high on the list. And then you have a lot of, you know, lots of people doing things that are, you know, important work but is not central to the, the mission. Um, and then looking at even things like properties of messages, like is it read, was it replied to, was it forwarded? Um, those are all kind of like the properties. So pretty much I would look at a message and make a determination based on those factors. You know, so example, something very significant. So a designer, a noted designer discusses a commission with a museum executive. That's pretty significant. An artist who's planned to have a retrospective exchanges a message with a curator about that retrospective. You know, very significant. Not so significant, you know, an opened letter, 
from a popular magazine, okay, not important, email from an executive to his husband or wife about picking up groceries, you know, no big deal, we don't want that. Um, so literally what I did was I, I went in and um, used Outlook, you know, took a copy of the mailbox and categorized, doing the kind of color coding function that they have in there, which is actually kind of cool and no one uses. Um, <laughs> and then you can even set it up so you can preview messages, um, without having to open them, like the first couple lines. Um, you can um, have it default where you just click once and it automatically becomes very insignificant. So that was helpful. Outlook 2010 plus was pretty good. Um, so what did I find after I did this for this three mailboxes? You know, literally, um, you know, people manage their mail differently. So um, in, in two of the cases, we had 40 to 70% of the emails could just be deleted outright or were pretty much flagged as insignificant or very insignificant. You had 5% of the emails that were only 5% in another case. And this was really like someone seemed to have a personal assistant. I mean, their email was very well managed. Um, you have disk space savings. So um, after you delete those emails, I got up to about 36% disk space savings. Um, you know, we're always trying to save IT resources, so that's good. The bad side here, though, is that, um, you know, pretty much it took me about an hour to pray 641 messages. So I, this is very, very labor intensive. So how can we make this go better? How can this go faster? So things I, you know, things I found was, for example, you know, I found you know, significant or very culturally significant emails in executive email boxes that were actually in the deleted items folder. What do you do with that? I, I'll put my, you know, I'm gonna say, I say you keep them. Unless they empty the deleted items folder, you know, then, but if it's in the deleted items folder, I, I think it's fair game. Um, so then, the, then there's this idea that, you know, if we just preserve the sent mail, isn't that just good enough? And what I did find with this study is it is not. Um, preserving sent mail as, just, as, as your set of significant email will not get all your significant email. Same thing is if you do, I'm gonna do sent mail in combination with email inboxes that have been acted upon or repl like so replied to or forwarded. Is that good enough to get significant email? I found it was not. Pretty much you still have to kind of go in to get um, more inbox items and other folders. Um, Unread messages are not necessarily insignificant, believe it or not. Um, an executive might have been briefed about something and didn't bother to read it. Um, so other speed up solutions. Um, pretty much what I found is that pretty much you, there are cases where you have large numbers of people who are always sending significant or always sending insignificant email. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, in this case, I found about you know forty to sixty-two per forty to sixty-two people were you know either significant or very significant, and then you had about up to about three hundred people which were very insignificant. So then the question is, you know, and then there's these borderline cases. These are people who are kind of maybe personal friends who also kind of merge into being uh, professional friends. So they might talk about the operation of the museum, but then they might you know, talk about their health problems. And so you want to be able to figure out who those, who those borderline individuals are. And interestingly, I found that those were five, in each case, it was five to seven individuals who were these kind of borderline cases where you really needed to do this kind of fine-grained appraisal. But for, for pretty much the vast majority, I think you can really just do a random selection, you know, do 10, 15%, and then decide, is this a significant sender, receiver, is this an insignificant one? and then save your time for these kind of borderline cases. Um, so I kind of call this taking more of a social network approach, understanding the roles of the people who are sending and receiving messages, really developing who these people are, what their relationship is, and then going from there. Um, so just you know, on tools, today you know, we don't really have great tools for doing appraisal. There's interesting stuff like sentiment analysis, but that doesn't really help you with appraisal. I mean, happy messages, great. Um, but, um, but I have to say, you know, Outlook's pretty good in, in the sense that you can really do sophisticated searching, sorting, grouping. Um, so it does really kind of help with appraisal work. Um, but I do think these new tools, if we do talk about new tools like automated tools, like predictive modeling and text analysis, what you'd really want to focus in on is, is kind of uncovering that relationship. Um, don't spend a lot of time figuring out what are topics are important, but really spending the time figuring out what's the relationship. Is it the professional? Is it the personal? Is it the mixed relationship? And then delivering those kind of verdicts to the digital archivist to make those, those choices. Um, you know, and other kind of, you know, I did a lots of Googling of people, you know, it's like, especially for making these distinctions between significant and very significant, like, you know, if someone has a Wikipedia page, that kind of thing. Um, 
So definitely, um, you know, may, maybe pulling in more biographical information on, on people based on what you can find on the web. I think that's a, that, that could be another way of making this work a little bit better. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank um, Kevin and Aaron and uh, the program committee for asking me to uh, speak on the uh, presidential email and archiving presidential email at the National Archives. Um, my name is Ken Hawkins. I've been with NARA for about, I guess, 20 years or so. And um, about, I guess, 10 years or so ago, I uh, got involved in a pro uh, project to define functional requirements for the EOP component of the Electronic Records Archive. And so I worked with the staff from the Presidential Materials Division, several of which are sitting over here. So if I say anything wrong or bad about the Presidential Records Act, they'll report me. Um, and um, got that system up and running and then got pulled into the actual transition uh, and the transfer of the Bush Presidential Records, the Electronic Records from the White House to the National Archives in 2008, 2009, and then have sort of stayed with the, the PRA records ever since, and it's been quite quite a ride. The photo on the top here is actually from the inside of the um, White House Data Center right around January 20th, 2009, on the, the, the day of the transition. The room was about half the size of this room, had a six foot tall piece of paper going around the entire perimeter of the room with all the systems that were going to be transferred, all the, all the exports that had to happen, who was doing them, when they were gonna be done, Etc. And of course, the, the critical time there was 12:01 on January 20th, because that's when the records legally leave the president's um, uh, possession and come into the possession of the National Archives. Um, everything else kind of proceeds from that. So, um, what I thought I would do quickly is just touch um, on sort of the technical and the legal context of the records. Um, the growth of the uh, sort of the volume and the variety of, of records, and I'll focus just on the email, but even within email, as we've learned today, there's lots of different formats and technical challenges. And then how the requirements of the Presidential Records Act or PRA sort of cut across the technical grain and sort of there's some kind of opposition between the requirements of the PRA and physically what you can do with systems and records. So it, it makes it particularly challenging. The FRA, which I won't really speak about, you have all the time in the world to schedule things and arrange for their transfer and disposition and whatnot. On the PRA, it all happens on January 20th or as soon as possible thereafter. So um, it's a bit different. And then um, I know that the theme is policies and guidance. Um, so I'll, try to talk a little bit about that, but basically the policies that we put into practice to make email actionable in the archival phase of the life cycle. That is, how do you get the records out of the systems at the White House in a format that's consumable by ERA and can be searched and accessed to meet the requirements of the Presidential Records Act. And what we do within that uh, context to, to attempt to put at least a baseline of preservation in, in place as well because the emphasis on, is on access um, and a lot of the technical activities that occur um, are really devoted towards optimizing access as rapidly as possible. But we also like to make sure that we preserve all the bits and keep them in the, the original order. So um, we're talking about volumes here. Uh, Ken Thibodeau uh, of the National Archives put this chart together and uh, after the Bush transition, that gives you some idea of the volume of email that's been transferred, electronic records that's been transferred to the National Archives going back to the 1970s. Um, everyone's head exploded at the end of the Clinton administration when 20 million emails came across and came into our custody. And then eight years later, uh, the Bush um, exchange and arms uh, corpus came in at about um, 225 million and then sort of went up from there after a lawsuit was settled and several <laughs> other accessions were made um, at the same, uh, in, the, in the same time frame. 
Um, but basically, the, uh, the email systems that were in place at the White House, someone had, uh, or actually Ed mentioned um, DOI getting sued quite a bit, and then as a result, implementing a capture all sent and all received. Essentially, that's the other organization that probably gets sued as often or more about its email has been the White House. It's been sued over its email practices. Uh, I think with every administration, at least since the Reagan administration, Iran Contra, Oliver North, et cetera, deleting emails. And so that's had a direct impact on their email practices and, um, and their attempt to find systems that set them aside as records. So um, the, the result is that um, and, this, and this actually derives also from the PRA, um, they point to a system and say, those are all records, export those, bring them across. There's no appraisal, no disposition per se, apart from just the kind of built-in assumption that all of the records are important, and so they all get transferred uh, in one fell swoop. Um, the, uh, just to give you a little bit of a highlight on the volume too, there was two, about 225 million emails that were transferred to the National Archives. In the process of, of readying those for transfer, the White House um, told us that there were over one billion emails in the archive. As a result of their activities to respond to um, the lawsuit that Crew and NSA filed, and also to show the judge that they had um, that they had email present and accounted for across all the organizational components of the White House. They had to uh, do statistical analysis to demonstrate what was the average volume of email for, for each component. And so in the process of doing that, they, um, for accounting purposes, they removed the duplicates. They did that statistically. When it came time to transfer the records physically, then the question came up, do you guys want a billion emails or do you want 225 million? And so the discussion went back and forth and came down to the lesser number. So essentially, <laughs> which is still a lot of email. Um, so, and it came across in um, EML format, the individual messages. So they identified each, each unique message and set it aside, retained it in, its, in a bucket or a folder that was con uh, traced up to the organizational component. The whole thing was so complicated that we decided the best way to, um, to assure that we got everything was to also take the source PSTs at the same time. So there's about 38,000 PSTs in the archive, and then those were processed out and equal 225 million emails. Um, real quickly, a timeline. Um, access really is what drives much of our activities. On January 20th, legal custody goes from the White House to NARA. Um, the, and shortly thereafter at 1201, the access request can come into the National Archives. And so it's a real, you know, th there's the law and the guidance drives policy, but really everything else is physics. How do you move that volume of email? That's really the big challenge. How do you move it in, into NARA's physical custody and into its systems and then make it searchable? So that's really the main thrust of the activity for the next nine months. In 2009, um, the email was moved over took about, um, all told, about six weeks altogether. All the email was from the OP to NARA by May, and then it was ingested and indexed by September of 2009. Um, the system, thus, w we had to get the biggest disk we could, the fastest disk, et cetera. Um, the um, platform that it's on is the <coughs> Hitachi content platform. I'm probably running fairly short of time here. Um, let's see. The, um, the system that we have in place, the HCP system, HCAP, has been in operation since December of 2008. We've gone through one technical upgrade or hardware refresh since then. We're about to undergo another one to handle the next transition. Um, the system as it's implemented pretty much follows this logical architecture of the various processing steps, which probably are a little bit hard to see, but it's basically analyzing the data type, exporting it, physically moving it, and then ingesting it, building the metadata up, et cetera. Pretty much follows the OAIS model, 
and then the system components down below uh, are, are suited together, put together to sort of handle all those functional requirements. Um, and then within each of those um, components of the system, we can apply archival services and controls. Every four to eight years, depending on if there's a second term, we get to move the data to, and so the bottom row there is really about um, data transport. If that all goes well, at the end of the day, um, the lights stay green at the White House, they stay green at the archives, and under the authorities of the uh, Presidential Records Act, people can request, authorized requesters can get to the records in the first five years, and then after the five-year anniversary passes, then the public can request them under FOIA. They go presumptively closed, presumptively open, um, and our goal at the same time is to make sure that the records are um, they're all checksummed at the file level on the way in, and so that, that checksum is maintained over, you know, in perpetuity, basically, so we know that none of the records have changed, and ultimately, um, the public will be able to get to them. Thanks. Hello, um, good afternoon. My name is Meg Macleer, and I'm a senior archive specialist here at the Library of Congress in the manuscript division. And my colleague, Kathleen O'Neill, um, is also a senior archive specialist. Um, so we're gonna talk to you a little bit today about our experiences with email in five minutes. We're, we're a lightning talk, we're fast. Okay, um, we are a collecting repository. Um, this very much defines our experiences with collecting born digital. Um, we collect both personal papers as well as organizational records. Um, we've been preserving electronic records since the mid-1990s. To date, we have about 1.2 terabytes of digital content preserved on the library's um, content server, um, which comes from about 30 collections. And we have about, I don't know, an unknown um, amount of digital content still lurking on tangible media in our unprocessed backlog, which we're re really looking forward to getting to. Um, email is um, relatively new to us. We first acquired it in 2012. And this probably reflects the fact that we substantively changed our ingest procedures and workflows between 2009 and 2011. So that really kind of distracted us and absorbed what we were doing. Um, so the first emails didn't come until 2012. And we've acquired them in two con very large congressional collections. Um, so talking about like you know taking the plunge in a major way. Um, as you can imagine, um, these congressional collections are personal papers, only in name only. Um, in terms of scale and scope, these are office files that are very much small organizations. Um, we are also um, and currently undergoing discussions with a number of other donors, as well as organizations whose records we collect. Um, what, just very briefly about our experiences about developing policy. Um, one thing that we have discussed among ourselves is that we're trying to be as format agnostic as possible in developing policy. So we're starting with the policies we already have in place for collecting, processing, preserving, and providing access to collection material. And we're changing those policies only where needed um, to, to accommodate the needs of a particular format. Um, so for instance, with deeds of gift, um, we have decided that we're not writing separate deeds of gift for digital content, um, but we're using one deed of gift for an entire collection. Um, another um, decision, um, we do accept collections on deposit, and we had a healthy debate um, about whether we would accept digital content on deposit as well. And for now, we are, um, although we may rev um, revisit that decision, as Kathleen will talk about. Um, access, um, this is one area where we deviated from our traditional policy. We do provide, on a case-by-case -case basis, access to unprocessed material. Um, but we made a blanket decision with digital content that we would not provide access to unprocessed digital content. 
Um, what we're finding is that um, policy development, as you can imagine, as all of you know, very much springs from experience. And so this is very much kind of an evolving um, process of defining and redefining. Um, so for us, because most of our experience is on acquisitions and on bit level preservation, that's where most of our policies have, um, have been developed. Um, in terms of acquisitions, and I'll just talk about this really quickly because Kathleen is going to tell you about one of the congressional collections as kind of a case study. Um, we find that acquisitions is very much shaped by the fact that we are a collecting repository. So traditionally, I have to tell you, I kind of whine about this, um, that, that no one is legally compelled to give us their stuff. Um, we have to woo, and, and, and if we're successful in wooing and get the material, um, we have to pretty much accept it in as-is condition um, or reject it um, in toto. Um, so, you know, very often we can advise on best practices for how digital content, including emails, should be created and maintained, but our advice is only that, is only advisory. Um, only now I have such a much deeper understanding after today about the realities of record management's programs, <laughs> and I realize that you also woo, um, you also <laughs> advise, and often that advice isn't taken. Um, so I can no longer whine. Um, we, I just also want to say we're, we're also very much employing the capstone approach. Um, I think the capstone approach is very rational, very logical, and, and is um, very doable in terms of selecting what material you want to bring in. So for these congressional offices, we're very much using that approach. And I think for the organizations we're talking to as well. Um, appraisal. We're finding that we're always invited to come and look at their paper stuff. Um, you know, please come look at our files and wear grubby clothes. Um, but but we're, we find that you know it's hands off in terms of their digital content. So pre-acquisition appraisal is only done through discussion. Um, it, it's not we're not given access. Um, so it, you have to be very very good at holding these discussions, which segues beautifully into what <laughs> Kathleen is going to tell you. So um, one of our congressional collections um, uh, is sort of a perfect case study because it had the best possible outcomes and sort of more difficult uh, outcomes. Um, we had a, a, con a congressional office um, where the donor was very interested in donating their electronic records and in particular their email. Um, the office had an archivist on staff and an IT administrator who worked very closely. They had a records management um, program in place for the last several years. I, the email by the staff had already been um, cleaned of all personal spam, everything, um, and that was delightful. And for us, um, it was a new experience for us. So we came to them and we were as honest as we could be. We were interested in the collection, but we didn't have experience. They understood that it was a pilot and they were eager to be um, part of that. Um, and so, I was blessed by the fact that I, the, this record management was in place. I had two professionals, the archivist and the ad admin, that I could speak to. Um, and in some cases, that got us a wealth of information. And in other cases, it was a little more problematic. Um, so what we ended up with in terms of email, there was two groups of email. There was the staff email, and there was the constituent uh, email. Now the staff email, um, there was CC mail and Adobe mail, but they had long ago been, they're in PDF form. So, but it was unclear in terms of history whether somehow at that time you could export to PDF or whether they printed them out and then scanned them. But in any case, that was a done deal and I couldn't, you know, n nothing was to be done about that. Um, the Outlook, um, that was, as Meg mentioned, a capstone approach. The staff email had been saved to their personal computers under their, basically, their My Documents, and about four years previous, when they came to a more um, network environment, they were moved to the network, so I believe we probably lost some attachments along the way there, but, um, but because they were under each of each staff's email, it's sort of difficult to estimate the size and the number of files um, for that, um, and then, comes the constituent email. So we had constituent email from 1989 to about 1999. And that was um, 
given to me on CDs. It had been archived, um, exported into flat text files with some bare bones information about what the database had originally looked like. That was about 525,000 files. Um, and that didn't really pose any problems for us during our ingest. Um, the big difficulty um, was the constituent services system, the more recent system, which covered 1989 to 2013. Um, and unfortunately, in this case, it's once again a pr pr proprietary system. Even the IT administrator had no contact with the company that was archiving it. So again, this was, as Meg said, not being able to look at it. It was really just not even understanding what the scope of it was, um, particularly because we hadn't um, ever done it before. Um, I sent missives out through um, the IT administrator hoping to get information. We really didn't get any communication back. He couldn't get anybody to answer him. I hoped for um, a sampling. Um, that didn't happen. So what we ended up getting was on a hard drive one day, it was delivered to me without fanfare, um, 1.8 million files. And um, we had multiple issues getting it through the system. So um, just um, one folder had 150 characters and that proved to um, be uh, not something our system could handle. So everything had to stop. The software had to be rewritten to be able to handle that. Special characters, um, that was the next time through. Everything kicked back because of special characters. Uh, again, more software uh, rewrites and because um, some of them could be replaced and some of them shouldn't be replaced. Um, but in the end, it was the number of files itself that proved to be the big obstacle. Um, we have a terrific system called the Content Transfer Services, which moves our digital content um, about, uh, across the servers. It also um, creates a checksum for every file, an inventory for whatever package that you're sending through the system, and it verifies um, the checksums and the inventory as the um, uh, collection material moves through the system. Well, as you can imagine, creating checksums and verifying checksums for 1.8 million files um, takes a lot of memory. Um, <laughs> just, and so um, that ended up taking almost a year to get through our system. And uh, there was a lot of software rewriting and a lot of things that happened behind the IT curtain that I don't understand. Um, but in the end, we had to break up the email collection into 10 separate um, containers. Um, basically, again, I would have loved to have input from the, the makers of the system about perhaps the best way to divide it up. Um, so we just had to go by the number of files, what was the optimum number of files to get through our system, which we ended up trying to keep it around 200,000 files per, per package, or we call it a bag. Um, so what did we learn from this? Um, one of the things I forgot to mention is this is a collection that is on deposit. Um, and in general, we don't like to take things on deposit, but if we think the collection is important enough, we certainly will in our effort to woo. Um, but there are some, that's one thing for paper, if you're going to get the boxes and you put them up on the shelf and you have that initial investment of people, um, you know, an inventory of the boxes, the, the people that have to move them. Um, but it's quite another thing when it takes almost a year of work by an IT staff to get it into the system. And um, I don't know, they would have to give you their reflection. They, they at the time, because I felt like I, I had the bad child, I had the misbehaving child <laughs> collection. Um, and they kept saying, no, 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 it's, it's, it's improving our capabilities, it's testing us, we're testing the system, this is a good thing. And in the end, it did improve um, their capabilities tremendously, but there is that question of whether this time and energy should have been spent on a collection that we may in the future not own. Um, and then best practices in terms of taking a material you can't truly appraise. Um, again, I, I, I do wonder whether the amount of resources spent on this particular um, set of emails um, is merited by what's in there. I have no way of knowing. Um, I had no way of knowing before we took it. Um, so, um, and, and again, 
Um, these were exported into PST and TXT files. Um, so then there's the question of migration. And if I had had a collection like an AOL collection, I would have felt a real, uh, compelled to immediately address migration, which would have been another set of um, resources and time um, on a collection that we don't, we don't own. Um, so in terms of donor communication, we learned a great deal. We got wonderful information from the IT person in terms of the, the, whose email it was, the, the, um, their title, how long they worked there, what their general um, functioning in the office was. Um, so that was sort of the icing on the cake, the, the perfect um, scenario, all the way down to kind of a blind, um, we get what we get and we don't know what we got <laughs> type of scenario. Um, did, did I miss anything about policy? Maybe we do it in, in Q&A. Okay. Um, okay. So that's it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Harton. I'm the archivist for the music division and the primary curator for tangible media and born digital content. Uh, the music division is primarily a personal papers division. We do have some record collections from organizations, but largely they are defunct, and those that are current have not really transferred much of their electronic content just yet. In a sense, we sort of have been piggybacking off of the efforts of Meg and uh, others in the manuscript division. Um, so what I hope to mention here is not tell elaborate tales of, of email acquisitions, but maybe some shreds of things that we've observed through communication with certain donors about email and trying to, to get uh, email for artists in the performing arts specifically. So one, one thing that has come up several times is that the email you may want is not necessarily the address of the creator. And we've had numerous occasions where uh, the spouse or the children of a composer, I'm thinking uh, George Crumb in particular, handles the communications and a lot of the uh, correspondence for that composer. So, you know, when you're hashing out agreements, you really want to comb the family network and see who's really responsible for a lot of the information that you want to acquire and be sure to get any passwords or archives or communicate with that person to make sure you get relevant material. We've already sort of beaten the attachment issue to death here, but I'm going to beat it a little bit more. Um, in, in one sense, the uh, attachments are almost old school for performing artists. Uh, in many cases, the, the attachment is not a supplementary file, it is the primary document and the email is the contextual information. So these can range from music composition software files, photographs, audio materials, script drafts, and all sorts of other things of varying size. And that's sort of where I'm going here, is that the increasing size of these files means that you're not seeing them as attachments anymore you're getting links to Dropbox accounts, FTP servers, photo bucket, things like this, where the material that's often uploaded is, may only be there for a fixed period of time or may require third-party permissions to access. Uh, a lot of composers and performers are collaborative artists, so you have work that may be submitted to Dropbox by one performer, modified and then returned there. Um, we've even had cases where uh, one of the contributing artists has passed away and the work continued to be modified electronically through that account. 
So these are, these are all important considerations in, in terms of how early you need to be involved with the process and what exactly is, is the nature of, of the material, material you're trying to collect because attachments just don't do it anymore. Um, and related to that is the size factor. Uh, we've, we've already seen some examples how culling email can greatly free up storage space. Well, the, this is, I think, more so with performing arts materials now that high definition is sort of the norm and uncompressed audio that can be made available in these increasingly larger attachments or on remote servers. So if you have artists producing video and, and uncompressed wave files and uploading them, well, that can accumulate very rapidly uh, despite the, the sense that there's an infinite uh, frontier of digital space out there. And we, we too have, uh, don't hold a lot of stock in our, our donors uh, pruning their email. Uh, particularly well. Uh, some of our most notable performers and composers continue to be very active in their later years, such as Stephen Sondheim or Angela Lansbury. Elliot Carter passed away at 104. He outlived his estate. Uh, so it's, <laughs> it's very, um, you, you know, it's, it's, I think, unrealistic to expect them to do a lot of work since they continually reuse material and go back to it over and over again in the course of their lifetime. Um, so just to, to cap things off, we're very interested, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have heard all of uh, the presenters today because before, as we start to shape our policies for acquisition, these and other things addressed today, we certainly want to consider and have the most comprehensive policy, not just for the challenges we have right now, but those that we're expecting in the future. Thank you. running a little bit long, but I think it would be great if um, we could get the speakers to come back up and so we can have our Q&A, um, if you guys wouldn't mind. I think we're going to bring up a couple extra chairs because we heard from you guys. Are you scanned? Or that there's more, there's mics over here too. Um, is there another LC staff person I could ask for a volunteer to work the mic on this side of the room? Thanks, Kate. Okay, so I think we heard. You guys are so collegial. That's nice. um, so I think we heard a lot of really interesting perspectives today. Um, you know, I think situations where your opportunities of working with donors and those where you don't have the opportunity to work with donors, you just get the materials at the end. But even if you do have the opportunity to work with the donors, not actually getting the chance to appraise the materials. So appraisal was another um, theme that I heard through this. So I guess I would just open up with those folks who could actually, you know, and I think Anthony, you got to do a research project where you were actually developing, you know, selection and appraisal methods. So if you had that opportunity, would you want to develop um, methods to help with your selection and appraisal policy and then put those out to donors? Or as you know, Meg said, we just sort of take everything. So there's a couple different approaches. I was going to mention that um, I said at the outset that we don't do appraisal per se on the Presidential Records Act side, but we do what we call data type analysis. We, we want to know what are the formats and the volumes that the White House is planning on providing to NARA as record. And as you can imagine, they're fairly sensitive about outsiders coming in beforehand and looking at their records to, to do that type of analysis. Um, so uh, we have a continual dialogue back and forth and we sort of achieved a little bit of a breakthrough this, this year 
by basically offering, instead of the normal route would be provide us samples, you know, of, of the record sets and then we'll bring them to our lab and look at them and so they would have to scrub them and redact them and go through eight lawyers to review them. So we finally just said, well, how about we come to your data center and sign an NDA, a non-disclosure mm -hmm. agreement, and let us just look, you provide us larger samples. And so that's actually worked quite a bit. And what we're doing is trying to doc, we're going to document those uh, technical characteristics of the data sets in an OAS compliance uh, submission information package spec so that, and then get them to sign off on it so that when it comes time to actually export the records, they'll be in the format that they um, they agreed to months before. So I would say if you have the chance, even on a, in a smaller uh, setting or a smaller volume of data, if you can get that advanced knowledge of what the format is ahead of time, you're way ahead of the game as far as being prepared. Um, can, can I also just clarify too, um, what we've been acquiring, uh, you know, congressional um, offices, and so the volume is huge. And so the capstone approach has been fantastic. And also in our discussions with organizations, um, we've definitely looked at roles um, and in terms of um, selecting what we want to acquire. I think it would be very different um, working with, um, uh, as you know, Chris is, is going to be doing, um, working with individuals, um, you know, maybe involved in the creative process. Um, that'd be, you know, personal account. That would be very different. Um, one thing also is that you kind of have realized um, just go with what's doable, with what's simple and straightforward. And so in terms of calling, it's like if you can just get people to, you know, segregate their personal um, email, the stuff that they really don't want to come to the Library of Congress, it's like, yay, that's great. Um, that's, that's wonderful. And um, so just, you know, kind of what's in it for them, you know, um, get buy-in at least to do that. The one little bit I would add is, you know, um, definitely in, our, in, in the situation I worked in, um, you know, you're definitely, I like the idea of, you know, recommunicating back with record creators saying like, hey, this is actually what we're, you know, what we find significant, this is what we find insignificant. Um, but then you're still going to get people who are, are going to like totally like dump their email box right before they leave. And like I, I saw many examples of that that were, you know, email boxes totally gutted. You know, they didn't care. They wanted their email gone. They wanted no record of themselves. So that's going to happen too. And I, you know, I guess you know, unless you take kind of like the Big Brother approach, which I think most most people, you know, we don't want to do that approach where we're taking things in. Um, but um, it, it's going to happen too. And I, I don't see any other way around it. But you know, maybe that's not so bad. Some questions from the audience. This question is for David Kirsch. Um, you mentioned doing a risk assessment when you were looking at the avocado emails. Could you describe a little bit about what that assessment was and how you implemented it? Uh, sure, well, I can also direct you to the to the, that sort of readme file. Uh, I'm happy to send that, and um, Aaron, we can add that to the mm -hmm. to the list of documents Definitely. that are available to participants. Um, but I mean, what we tried to do was to th to um, you know, look at the contents and figure out, well, what are the kinds of risks that, that are present here? Um, and, you know, initially we thought, well, should we be redacting credit card numbers? And we thought, well, they, you know, turns out these emails are more than 10 years old. They, most of these credit cards have expired or, you know, passport numbers. Well, passports expire. We can't tell, you know, different countries have nine digit passports and eight digit passports. And, and we didn't, so we were trying to obviously um, disrupt the collection as little as possible, you know, but for, you know, real clear, you know, nine digit, three dash, two dash four <laughs> um, uh, social security numbers, we did uh, introduce the simulacra. So, uh, I mean, I think for us, the, the, um, uh, the, the issue was, um, looking through these records, you know, uh, it, it was it was a um, it was a discovery process. It wasn't something that we had fixed in our mind in advance. Uh, you know, we had to kind of figure out what was in there to figure out what the risks were. And in that sense, I, th I think that's probably common to everyone who works with an email collection. Is you don't realize what the particularities of it are until you're actually kind of poking around in it, and then you realize. Oh, <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> um, 
So, but but uh, I'd be happy to have, uh, as you know, in, invite everybody to please give us feedback on, on on the process that we did employ. If 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 we can do it better, we'd like to. Any other questions? So I had another one. Um, actually that talks about, so when you're communicating externally or with your donors who you're working with, but what about um, when you're working on policies or guidelines for communicating internally with the parts of your organization that might not understand what appraisal is? So for example, um, your lawyers or your IT um, executives. So having to get them to understand that and do you have any, any experience or comment on that? Um, is it useful to have workflows or poly guidelines to develop just for that and communicating internally? Um, I think the main thing is don't assume that you both use the same word in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but otherwise, I have, I have to say, we were spoiled um, in the manuscript division. Working with the IT side of the library was fantastic. I mean, really bright young people who were curious, who wanted to know what we did and how we did it. And it was a joy. So it's a totally skewed experience. So. Um, anyone else or anyone from um, any of our other speakers today who might want to comment on anything that we've talked about policy related within your own organization that might touch on any of this? Well, it ha we have been talking about this all day, right? <laughs> so um, I guess with that, we will break for our last session. Um this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.